Welcome to lecture number two, the Commerce Clause and Federal Legislative Power. Virtually every constitutional law course will cover the scope and evolution of federal legislative power. Most will focus on the Commerce Clause, which has been important historically. And you can bet that if your professor covered the Commerce Clause in class, he or she will find a way to test it on the exam. In this hour, we'll cover three aspects of the subject. First, we'll begin with an overview of the federal structure. Second, we'll turn to the evolution and scope of federal power under the Commerce Clause. And third, we'll close with a summary of the problem of state interference with the federal system, the so-called dormant Commerce Clause. First, the federal structure. The Constitution of the United States creates a national government. Article 1 specifies the legislative power. Article 2, the executive power. Article 3, the judicial power. Since the legislature is supposed to make law, the law-making power of the national government is spelled out in Article 1. Specifically, Article 1, Section 8 lists the powers of Congress. There are a great many of them. They include the power to coin money, the power to declare war, the power to provide for an army and a navy, power to legislate for the District of Columbia, power to enact laws on bankruptcy, patent and copyright, the power to tax. Most important, at least historically, Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. In common parlance, Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce. Now, the original powers of Congress in Article 1, Section 8 were supplemented by the Civil War Amendments. The 13th Amendment not only abolished slavery, it also gave Congress the power to legislate against the badges and incidents of slavery, that is, the power to legislate against racial discrimination. The 14th Amendment guaranteed equal protection and due process, and it gave Congress the power to enforce those rights by appropriate legislation. Similarly, the 15th Amendment secured the right to vote against racial infringement, and it gave Congress the power to enforce that guarantee as well. So the powers of Congress are found not only in the original Article 1, Section 8 provisions, but also in the so-called enforcement provisions of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. What the federal government does not have is a general police power. The police power refers to the inherent power of government to promote public health, safety, welfare, morals. State governments have a general police power. That is, they can presumptively do anything. But the federal government does not. Since the federal government's powers are meticulously spelled out in the Constitution, it has been settled since the beginning of the Republic that federal legislation is valid only if affirmatively authorized by one of the federal powers. That means every single federal statute has to be related to one of the grants of power in the Constitution. Otherwise, the law is ultra vires, beyond federal power, and unconstitutional. State laws, by contrast, may be enacted under the general police power. State laws need not be affirmatively authorized by the federal constitution, but sometimes, of course, they are prohibited by the federal constitution. Finally, there's a clause authorizing Congress to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Just one point. To remember here, the Necessary and Proper Clause is not an independent power of Congress. Rather, it augments the other powers. It's an add-on, an addition to the other powers of Congress. 
One of the most important of all constitutional decisions, McCulloch versus Maryland. The Supreme Court ruled that necessary and proper meant appropriate and convenient. Opponents of federal power had argued that the phrase necessary and proper meant essential, indispensable to the exercise of an enumerated power. And had this strict test been adopted, federal legislative power would have been crippled at the outset. Instead, the court said, necessary and proper doesn't mean that Congress can do only that which is indispensable to the regulation of interstate commerce. Rather, in McCulloch, the court said Congress can do anything that is appropriate, convenient for the regulation of interstate commerce. Finally, this scheme of enumerated federal powers is reinforced by the Tenth Amendment. That provision declares that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Now, this is not a very clear provision. Most scholars think of it as a truism. It states that the powers not delegated to the national government are reserved to the states or to the people, which is simply another way of saying that all federal actions must be affirmatively authorized by the Constitution. It would be a great surprise if anyone listening to this tape had studied all of the various legislative powers of the National Congress. But the one federal power that virtually all of us will have studied, often in exhausting detail, is the commerce power. As you know, it has a very long history. And generally, that history is a history of expansion of the commerce power to keep up with the increasingly integrated national economy and the increasingly national focus of political and economic regulation. Let's go through the history rather quickly. I want to build to the more recent decisions, which I th are likely candidates for constitutional law examinations. Our story begins with Gibbons versus Ogden, 1824. The actual issue in Gibbons versus Ogden was extremely easy. The question was, could Congress license steamboat traffic between New York and New Jersey? And the answer is, of course. That's the clearest possible case of interstate commerce. And if the Commerce Clause means anything, it means Congress can regulate interstate transportation. Gibbons is remembered today not for the result, but for the opinion by Chief Justice Marshall, which stated very broadly that Congress had the power to regulate, in, to regulate commercial intercourse having interstate impact. Now, that's an important idea. Gibbons did not simply say Congress could regulate interstate transportation. It said Congress could regulate commercial intercourse having an interstate impact. As you will hear shortly, modern decisions hark back to Gibbons when they focus on effect on interstate commerce. Later in the 19th century, courts began to draw a distinction between commerce, on the one hand, and manufacture, on the other. Commerce was within Congress's power to regulate. Manufacture was not. And for a long time, the court tried to define the extent of the commerce power by contrasting commerce and manufacture. The problem, of course, is that economically, manufacture becomes commerce. And therefore, intrastate manufacture affects interstate commerce. Another distinction that the court used in the late 19th and early 20th century 
was to distinguish between direct versus indirect effects. The court said, in some cases, Congress can regulate activities that have a direct effect on interstate commerce, but not activities that have an indirect effect on interstate commerce. But as you would guess, this distinction proved unmanageable. What's a direct effect? What's an indirect effect? Turns out to be mostly how you choose to characterize it. In the aftermath of the Great Depression, federal economic regulation exploded. In famous cases, Schechter Poultry, 1935, Carter Coal Company, 1936, the Supreme Court struck down New Deal legislation on the grounds that it exceeded Congress's power under the Commerce Clause. Finally, in 1937, the court turned back toward the Gibbons approach and began to ask, not is this commerce, but does this affect commerce. That is the beginning of the modern era under the Commerce Clause. Now, here is the Commerce Clause today. In order to understand the current scope of the Commerce Clause, it's useful to distinguish between federal regulation of the private sector and federal regulation of the public sector. We'll deal first with the private sector. In regulating the private sector, that is, in regulating the conduct of private businesses and individuals, the commerce power runs almost to the ends of the earth. Almost nothing is beyond federal legislative power under the Commerce Clause. There are two theories, one of which almost always works. First, Congress can regulate anything that crosses state lines. If an item is in interstate commerce, Congress can regulate it, regulate how it's made, how much the people who worked on it are paid, what features the product has, to whom it can be sold, etc. Congress can regulate anything that crosses state lines. Second, Congress can regulate even intrastate activity, even intrastate activity that has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Congress can regulate even intrastate activity that has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Now take the first idea, crossing state lines. Of course, we all know Congress cannot regulate participation in interstate commerce in ways that are independently invalid for example, Congress could not prohibit all sexually indecent material from crossing state lines. That would violate the First Amendment. But Congress can regulate products or activities that cross state lines. And a famous example is the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That statute prohibits discrimination on the basis of race or religion in public accommodation. such as stores, inns, restaurants, and the like. The legislation was upheld because the products sold in stores, used in inns, served in restaurants, crossed state lines, and therefore Congress had the power to regulate those activities. Additionally, Congress can regulate any activity that has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Now, it's very important to understand here that the question of substantial effect is judged in the aggregate. Think of the famous old case of Wickard versus Filburn, which you may have read. We have laws in this country against growing too much food. A farmer grew wheat in unauthorized amounts, and the wheat gendarmes got after him and said he was violating the federal regulations. So the farmer went to court and said, by what right do you folks in Washington have to tell me that I cannot grow wheat on land I own here in Ohio? And the Fed said, well, it's a regulation of interstate commerce. 
The farmer said, what do you mean interstate commerce? I grow 40 acres of wheat. We harvest the wheat. We feed it to the pigs. We kill the pigs. We eat the pigs. Nothing goes anywhere. And the Supreme Court said, well, Mr. Farmer, we understand why you as a layman might think that was local. But if you'd been to law school, you would know that the test is not whether your activity individually affects interstate commerce. The test is what would happen if a hundred million other Americans did the same thing. Then where would we be? Well, if you judge substantial effect in the aggregate, in other words, if the question is, does the entire nation substantially affect interstate commerce in a particular activity, the answer is almost always yes. Everyone who studies the Commerce Clause will have read United States versus Lopez, 1995. In that case, the Supreme Court struck down as beyond the commerce power, a statute making it a federal crime knowingly to possess a firearm within 1,000 feet of a school. Now, Lopez may signal a revival of rigor in interpreting the commerce power, or it may not. The uncertainty derives from the particular statute invalidated in Lopez. That statute, unusually, did not require any particular nexus to interstate commerce. Most federal statutes do require such a nexus. For example, that some person or product has moved in interstate commerce. But the Lopez statute, the Gun-Free School Zones Act, did not. Moreover, the statute was not supported by legislative findings of an effect on interstate commerce. Most federal statutes are. Usually Congress conducts hearings and invites witnesses and concludes that this or this act, this or that activity, again, in the aggregate, affects interstate commerce. In the Gun-Free School Zone Act, Congress made no such findings. So here's the uncertainty, and it leads to a very good exam possibility. If Lopez is taken seriously, it may signal a revival of meaningful limits on the commerce power. But if Lopez is read in light of the particular statute, it may mean very little. And it is precisely this uncertainty that an exam question will try to probe. Now, the easiest way to ask the question would be to take the statute invalidated in Lopez or some similar kind of statute and add the missing ingredients. For example, would it be unconstitutional for Congress to punish as a federal crime the knowing possession in a school zone of a weapon that had moved in interstate commerce? Do you see the difference? Lopez does not answer that question. Would it be, un would it be unconstitutional for Congress to punish as a federal crime knowing possession in a school zone of a weapon that had moved in interstate commerce. The traditional rule is that Congress can regulate persons or things in interstate commerce. And it is very likely, but not entirely clear, that Congress could repass the statute invalidated in Lopez and make it constitutional simply by requiring that the weapon have traveled in interstate commerce. I think that's a great exam question. If I were studying for a con law exam, that's a question I would be prepared to answer. Here's a slight variation on the same theme. Would Lopez have come out differently if Congress had held hearings, had heard witnesses, had made findings that firearms in school zones have a substantial effect on interstate commerce? Could Congress have changed the outcome in Lopez simply by rehearsing its reasons for believing a substantial effect existed? Answer, no one knows. But it's at least a possibility and, again, a good possible exam question. 
The other half of the commerce power concerns federal regulation of the public sector activities. Can the federal government regulate the states themselves? Can the federal government require that states and localities do thus and so? Generally speaking, the answer is yes, but there's a good deal more to be said here. Now, in considering federal regulation of the public sector, take first the easy case. The easy case is where the federal government regulates general commercial activity in terms that apply not only to private businesses and industries, but also to state and local governments. Examples are minimum wage laws. Minimum wage laws apply not only to private employers, but also to state and local government employers. Examples are laws requiring occupational safety. Those laws require, re, apply across the board to private industry and to governmental employment. Laws regulating pension, anti-discrimination laws and the like, all of, apply across the board, both in the private and public sector. So long as federal regulation applies across the board, it will be upheld so long as a substantial effect on interstate commerce is shown. Let me say this again. So long as the federal regulation applies to the public sector and the private sector alike, such as a minimum wage law, occupational safety law, anti-discrimination law, so long as the law applies to the public and private sectors alike, it will be upheld. The hard case comes when Congress enacts a statute applicable only to state and local governments. Here you run into something called the anti-commandeering principle. Anti-commandeering principle basically means this. Congress cannot force states to enact or enforce regulation. Congress cannot force states to enact or enforce regulation. The leading case on the anti-commandeering principle is New York versus United States from 1992. That case involved a federal statute that required states to take possession of low-level radioactive waste. In essence, the statute said to the states, you must find some way of dealing with low-level radioactive waste. If you don't, then you have to take possession of it, meaning it becomes your problem. Now, the Supreme Court struck down that law. It did not strike down the law on the grounds that low-level radioactive waste had no substantial effect on interstate commerce. That was not the problem. The court was prepared to concede that the disposal of low-level radioactive waste did have a substantial effect on interstate commerce and was within federal legislative power. The problem was that Congress had tried to commandeer the legislative processes of the states by directly compelling them to enact and enforce a federal regulatory program. That's a quote. Congress cannot commandeer the legislative processes of the state, of the states, by directly compelling them to enact and enforce a federal regulatory program. Basically, the Supreme Court thought that respect for states as such prohibits Congress from using them against their will, from forcing them to participate in regulatory programs, from commandeering state governments for federal purposes. Now, that may sound like a big deal, but practically it is not. Congress cannot force states to adopt or enforce federal regulation. Okay, fine. What can Congress do? Here are three alternatives. First, Congress can regulate directly at the federal level. 
Congress can create federal officers who specify the conditions and the procedures and the location of waste disposal. Why? Because radioactive waste disposal may cross state lines and in any event plainly affects interstate commerce. So Congress cannot coerce states to adopt or enforce federal regulation, but Congress can carry out the federal regulation itself. That's the first alternative. A second option available to Congress is called conditional preemption. Congress can say to the states, uh, we adopt the following regulations, which will apply unless the state adopts its own regulations that meet our standards. That's called conditional preemption, and you see why? The state is given an option. It's not much of an option, but the option is you adopt standards that we think appropriate, or we will adopt the standards for ourselves. You do it our way, or we'll do it for you. That's conditional preemption, and there's no problem. The third alternative available to Congress is perhaps the most widely used. Congress can bribe the states. That is, Congress can say, we'll give $100 million to every state that does the following. But if you take the money, you have to play by our rules. There are 5,000 regulations you need to comply with. No problem with that. That's the spending power. The spending power. And the spending power allows Congress to spend its own money any way it chooses. Now, you see, this is not a major practical issue. Congress can regulate directly at the federal level. It can tell the states to regulate or Congress will adopt statutes that over that deal with the problem. Just kind of the threat of direct federal regulation. Or Congress can bribe the states into compliance by giving federal money to the states and making that money conditional on observing federal standards. No problem. All Congress cannot do is directly to coerce the states to adopt or enforce federal regulation. By the way, in 1997, the anti-commandeering principle was invoked to strike down a provision of the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act. Uh, the case is called Prince versus United States. That's P-R-I-N-T-Z versus United States. And it struck down an interim provision, a transitional provision in the Brady Handgun Bill. The court ruled 5-4 that Congress could not require state law enforcement officers, mostly local sheriffs, could not require state law enforcement officers to perform background checks on folks who wish to purchase handguns. And you see why? Because that was a commandeering of state government for federal purposes. Again, what can Congress do? Congress can have the FBI perform the background checks. They can do it directly. Or Congress can appropriate money for the states if the states agree to perform the background checks. That's fine. That's the spending power. All Congress cannot do is directly to coerce state and local governments to enforce federal regulation. Before we leave the Commerce Clause, let me make one final observation and recommendation. If you studied Lopez in your con law class, and the chances are overwhelming that you did, you should pay particular attention to Justice Thomas's concurring opinion. That's not because your professor will agree with Justice Thomas. On the contrary, I would expect relatively few law teachers to agree with Justice Thomas on this issue. But his concurrence presents an issue of genuine importance and difficulty, which you must be prepared to address on your examination. 